and welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is David M. Arditi, Associate Professor of Sociology and Anthropology and Director of the Center for Theory at the University of Texas Arlington. We will discuss his book, Getting Signed, Record Contracts, Musicians, and Power in Society, which will be published by Paul Gray McMillan. So welcome to the show, David. Thanks for having me, Brian. Ah, the pleasure's all mine. I'm so glad we connected over Twitter because I really enjoyed reading this book and I learned a lot from it as well um, about how the music industry works and specifically how the music industry works from the perspective of of a of a musician of a of an artist uh, but before we start the interview i was wondering if you could kind of tell listeners a little bit about yourself so they kind of have a sense of where you're coming from in writing this book and why you have such an interesting perspective on this subject absolutely um so I decided to write about this subject because I myself am a musician. I'm a drummer. I spent years gigging when I was in college working on my bachelor's and my master's. That was the prime time when I was playing a lot of music, um, playing music primarily in Blacksburg, Virginia, around Virginia Tech. And uh, I was for a while playing in about six bands at any given moment. Um, from jazz to hip hop to prog rock. And I made a lot of observ observations during that time. And when I began working on my master's, I decided to write my master's thesis. I was in political science at the time about the politics of Napster. Um, I'm of the Napster generation. I, I think I was a um, senior in high school when Napster launched. Uh, so I was interested in the way that mechanism operated for independent music musicians that allowed them to put their music out there in a completely equal way, in some sense, uh, to the major record labels. And the kind of formative moment that I had in doing my research was the bass player I played with was is good friends with Victor Wooten. And we drove out to Nashville to uh, go to the Victor Wooten Band rehearsal. And I was talking to one of the Wooten brothers, I think it was Reggie, about time travel. And then I heard Joe Wooten, who I believe plays for the Steve Miller Band. He started going, I don't give a F about Napster. I only make 10 cents on the sale of any given album. I want people to be in the crowd and Napster gets people file sharing. I guess Napster was dead at that point, but file sharing allows people to hear my music and that gets them in the door. So that kind of put me on this route of doing research. And uh, through my different experiences, I was always thinking in the back of my head, what, what impact does everything have on musicians? themselves, musicians as people, musicians as workers. And some different moments in my uh, musician career kind of pointed to this affect that musicians often have, that number one, they're the best. Uh, nobody is better than them at guitar or drums or singing and they're the next big thing. They're going to be signed to a record contract and they're on their way to great things. Well, everybody has that perspective. However, when you read the literature, nobody actually makes it in music. Everybody tends to um, kind of toil around in their careers. They might play a lot of gigs and work at a guitar shop. They might um, have some other day job. Very few people actually make money from playing music. And even those people who do, when you read the literature and you read interviews from different uh, famous musicians, even if they're famous and signed to a record contract, they very rarely ever recoup 
their record contract advance and make it in the industry. So what really started interesting me was, what is this thing? What is this feeling that everybody has that they're going to make it? If, if only they can sign a record contract and everyone is just about to sign a record contract. Mm. Well, so maybe for listeners who don't have the kind of firsthand familiarity with the music business that you do, you could talk a little bit about what it's like as a musician to be in the music business and sort of dealing with clubs and record companies and promoters and A&R people and so on and so forth. Like, what's the experience like as a musician and what, what kind of happens as you're trying to make a career as a musician? Well, an interesting phrase came to mind uh, last week. In order to be successful at music, you have to be a good business person. And when you reverse that, if you said the opposite, that would just sound ridiculous. Um, so the, the kind of first thing is musicians always have to be thinking about how to sell themselves. They have to um, not just be thinking about what's good music. They have to think about what listeners want to hear. They have to think about uh, how they're going to book gigs. They have to develop kind of business rapport with um, bar managers and bar owners. And that's a very different skill set. Those two things have nothing to do with each other, playing music or doing business. Um, but the, the kind of system that we, we live in places playing music as a commodity as the number one thing. Uh, so when people make music, they're making it to sell. In the book, you focus, among other things, pretty heavily on sort of the recording industry and recording contracts and record producers and distributors sort of what is the relationship between a musician or a band and a recording company like what does that look like and sort of what are the kind of typical terms of that kind of relationship yes so the the terms of the relationship is that when musicians sign to a record contract they are independent contractors they're not employees of the record label so their contract states the same kind of thing as if um, a university uh, hires an outside company to uh, disinfect doors during COVID-19. So they work for the university, but they're fulfilling a contract. So those workers are not employees of the university. So that relationship means um they you know number one the record labels don't have to follow labor law because contract law supersedes labor law i'm not a lawyer i, th I think that's right brian <laughs> yeah um, i mean typic typically typically, typically. I mean, w there, there's exceptions of course um you can't just say well you signed a contract so you can now work 80 hours a week and um so since they're independent contractors, they still retain pretty much all the risk. And when they sign to the record contract, uh, what they get is they get an advance. So it's kind of easier to, to think in terms of the CD era, just in terms of numbers. Uh, but when a musician signs the record contract, they get an advance in return for ownership of the copyright. So the record label takes a certain ownership of the copyrights of the musicians. And the advance, uh, let's say it was a $500,000 advance, they get, um, what that means is musicians have to pay back that $500,000 from their royalties of the sale of music in order to ever see a dime. So in the CD era, what that essentially worked out to was about 500,000 copies. 
uh, of a CD. So $500,000, musicians earn about a dollar off the sale of a CD. So that dollar goes back into recouping the advance. And in kind of simple terms, why I'm using the $500,000, which was pretty standard, uh, to have a gold album, you have to sell 500,000 albums. Um, very few artists actually sell five, go gold. So at the point when they hit 500,000, that's when they've broken even. And now they can start uh, making money from the sale. So if they sell 502,000 albums, they've made 2,000 to split between whatever the signed entity is, whether it's a single artist or a four piece band, they divide that $2,000. Well, so just to clarify, like when an artist gets an advance, say like a $500,000 advance, like you mentioned, does that mean the record company just like writes the band a check for 500 grand or like distributes it among the members of the band? Like, how does that work in practice? Do, do they actually get all that money or do do they not necessarily see all of it? They do not necessarily see any of it. Um, and it depends on what kind of manager they have about whether or not there's more of an active role. Um, but there's a, a good book by a drummer named um, Jacob Slichter. He was the drummer for Semisonic, which had the hit, song in the 1990s called uh, Closing Time. And he describes the whole situation of, in that book, I think it's called So You Want to Be a Rock and Roll Star. And he talks about one episode where he, the band was sent on a flight to do a radio spot they got to the to the place they were going. There was a whole uh, catered spread. Each member of the band maybe picked up a piece of fruit while they were leaving, and they never thought about it. And then later on, they found out that all that catering and the whole trip came out of their advance. So it's not that they get a $500,000 check, but... W- any kind of promotion that the label does for them is charged against that 500,000. And sometimes they increase it while you're going, right? So, oh, we overspent on catering and the advance turns into $510,000. But the bands don't actually see that money. They will often pay themselves a stipend out of it. So what that ends up looking like is about information I've seen is a band, a four piece band might take $20,000 as a stipend. So split four ways, it's $5,000 a person for over the course of a year that they're actually getting from the record contract. Mm. Well, so one of the really interesting things about your book, to me anyway, was the way you talked about quote unquote getting signed as an ideology. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what you mean by that. Well, an ideology is, in my terms, an up down, upside down picture of the world. Karl Marx describes it that way when he talks about a camera obscura, which was the kind of predecessor to a camera. It was when people put a little pinhole in a box and a dark box and they stood inside of it and they traced the outside, which would then, uh, as light refracts, it would flip the picture upside down. Uh, so I see the record contract as an ideology or the ideology of getting signed as an ideology, because it is an upside down picture of the world. People think that signing a record contract is the means to success when in actuality signing the record contract is a means to exploitation. It's the route through which record labels can make money off of recording artists. Yeah. And this is one thing that I found really interesting because there's a way in which, I mean, it seems like what you're describing is a circumstance where 
record companies, in effect, use these contracts and the ideology of getting signed as a way of encouraging artists to identify with their own interests as opposed to the interests of the artists and the fans and the people actually engaging in a productive relationship with each other. You're exactly right. They start to think of themselves as small business owners instead of as musicians, and that's the ideological component to it, right? They they think, okay, well, what is really important to me are are my copyrights. I need to protect my copyrights because that's the means through which I put food on my table, potentially. Instead of thinking of it in terms of the kind of labor that I do is making music. And just as anybody else does labor, I get paid for the work that I do. Musicians that are signed to a record contract believe they own this music and that that's their route to productive living. But it's that thought that they actually own something that keeps them from earning an income. I mean, it seems like in a lot of ways, what's at least partially responsible for this is sort of a differing set of values. I mean, it seems like the musicians value one aspect of their engagement with what they're doing and what they're producing and record labels value something quite different. And in a sense, like the ideological aspect that you're talking about seems to like reflect record labels sort of taking advantage of the kind of moral or um, the sort of the values that musicians have and the things that they care about in order to advance their own interests. Absolutely. And, and I think you would be hard pressed to find a musician that does not see value in copyright. They believe that copyright will change their lives. That if, if you got rid of copyright, then uh, somebody else would be able to exploit their hard earned work and they would not be compensated for the music that they make. And there, there would be no value to continuing to do music. It's a really tough conversation to have. And I have these conversations pretty consistently. I run a online archive uh, for local music, and it's, it's called Music Detour. And when I contact musicians about contributing to this archive, it's completely open access. It's completely free. It's what I see as a service to get people's music out there. They're not being exploited in any kind of way. I don't make any money from it. Excuse me. Um, and they still want to say, well, how do I make money from putting my music on your site? I'm giving away something for free. Whereas I see it as, number one, cultural preservation. And number two, a way to get people's music out there. So even if, uh, let's say, a band uses something like SoundCloud, or, or um, SoundCloud is a business that sells their data, that earns revenue off of putting their uh, music on there and the different um, data analytics that come along with it, they make revenue. They don't share that revenue with the artist. Uh, so even when something feels free to the musician, it's not always free. And in the case of Music Detour, it actually is free. And they can take it down. They can do whatever they want to with it. Um, but there's there's no economic incentive going in, at least on my end. But they remain concerned about it. Well, so, I mean, as a copyright law professor, we sort of have a just-so story we tell about kind of copyright and incentives where, you know, copyright provides an economic incentive for authors to create works of authorship. And, you know, we solve market failures by enabling people to internalize, you know, positive externalities associated with what they do, blah, 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 blah. Like in reality, 
is is that really what's happening in the music business in relation to musicians like are musicians really practically speaking in a position to use copyright in that way especially given the nature of the sort of the structure of the music industry and if not why do musicians care so much about copyright ownership I, I mean i'm glad you brought up the idea of incentivizing um there's uh a couple years ago near neil portnow who is the or was the president of the recording academy that runs the grammys he went up on the grammys and he said it, it was part of the recording at academy's fight against uh ad supported streaming and they said he said artists uh, and i'm paraphrasing recording artists in a few years we won't have best new artists because people will no longer want to make music because they won't make money from it which is all about that incentive right the economic incentive to make music when in actuality, the vast majority of musicians make music and they don't make any money from it. Uh, so it's an interesting turn of phrase that he used. He, he used that kind of copyright. If we don't value music, then nobody's going to want to do it. When in fact, the recording industry does not value music and yet people keep wanting to record. So I mean, like, so so to, to to like put a finer point on that, exactly what does the recording industry value? Because like one of my kind of takeaways from your book was that in a lot of ways it doesn't really seem like the recording industry is about music qua music at all, but really something quite different. Yeah, I mean, the music industry and the recording industry within it is concerned about making profits. Um, Back in, I think it was 2006, there was this great documentary that came out called Before the Music Dies. And one of the big points that they go into in that documentary is the recording industry is most concerned with quarterly profits. profits. So um, one, one point that kept coming back to was Bob Dylan. If Bob Dylan were trying to start his career today, which was 2006, he would never n make it. Nobody would ever hear of Bob Dylan because it's some kind of acquired taste. And the only reason why Bob Dylan caught on was because r DJs, radio station DJs would just play it. And since that was the only thing playing, you had to listen to it and kind of grow this taste for it. Um, versus the recording industry 2006 which essentially they they hit music they push it they push it if it doesn't hit they get rid of it because all they're really concerned about is those uh first three months that uh the music is out and they don't care what happens after a year for it to catch on if it hasn't caught on at that point then they don't care about it and i think that today with streaming this is accelerated beyond a quarter system to a couple days a week that's all a song gets to hit if it doesn't hit it moves on to the next uh system so all that they care about is getting that music through and with streaming it, it's kind of really important if you look at something like Lil Nas X's Old Town Road that song blew up like crazy because Lil Nas X not that not to take away from his musical talent, but he is the master of memes. And if you read up on how he kind of launched his career is he was great at Twitter and he was great at TikTok, And he, he knew how to generate views on something uh, digital. So he created this song and it just blew up and the record industry gr jumped onto it. He didn't really need a label. He was already getting uh, millions of streams. They just took it to that next level. And then 
his next two songs didn't really even catch on. And I haven't heard of, of little Nas X in a couple months at this point. Well, so I mean, and this really gets to like the point you were making about the idea of signing as ideology, because it seems to me that, you know, like we're seeing this huge technological shift where a lot of the efficiencies that the recording industry brought to the music business, you know, like the capital and the ability to, you know, publish and distribute works in physical media just don't matter anymore. Right. I mean, everyone's listening to music digitally, everyone's streaming, like music distribution in some ways is so much more seamless and kind of quote unquote democratic than it ever was before. And yet it seems like artists still really sort of fetishize this idea of having a relationship to a label. Now, I wonder if you could kind of talk about why that is, what causes that and what it means sort of from like what you've seen uh, both personally and also as a, as a scholar. Well, I think there's two dynamics to it. Uh, the number one is even though artists don't need that efficiency anymore, uh, of you know, labels owning big studios and having the distribution capacity. Uh, if somebody wants to be huge, if you want to be Taylor Swift, you really can't do it without the marketing arm of a record label. So they do do something. They do something very important if you want to launch your career. But the second part of it is that belief in the system. It's been shot through since Ralph Peer that the thing to do is to to sign a record contract and that's your route to um, succeeding in the music industry. It takes both sides. And even though we can use digital technology to distribute music, to promote music, to do all those things, the major record labels still retain the ability to make or break an artist. So if Brian Fry was about wanted to put an album out and you could record it on your laptop in your home and you put it out there, can you get on the front page of Apple Music? Can you get onto Spotify playlists? Uh, can you get onto radio? Can, the major record labels are still critically important to making it through those different dynamics. Do, do you think musicians who are dealing with record labels necessarily understand that? I mean, do you think musicians know how to negotiate for those kinds of benefits that record labels can still provide to them? Or how do musicians think about their relationship to the record label? I think it varies. I think it depends on how long the musician's been in the game. Uh, from just kind of anecdotal evidence through my research, if you speak with um, young musicians, uh, let's say 18 to 21, their dream is to sign that record contract. They don't know a lot about record contracts, but they know it's the thing that they want. When you start talking to musicians that are a little further into the game and then later in their careers, they're a lot more level-headed about the whole thing. So I had one conversation with a musician. Um, he His parents were touring artists, uh, kind of the side musicians um, and he toured around with them as a kid. And so now he's doing his own thing. And I, I was asking him about um, whether or not he would sign a, a record contract. And he said, I wouldn't sign a record contract until I was ready until everything on my end was ready to go. I had the right kind of manager, the right kind of support. And the only reason why I would sign is because that's the only way you can really become a, a star. If I'm not trying to become a star, then I don't need the, the label. I can do things on my own. I can book gigs. I can 
tour around. I can make a decent income through the kind of ways I learned from my parents that I don't need a label to do for me. But the only way he, he again, he uh, was very adamant about this. The only way to really make it big is if you sign a record contract. Well, so that, I mean, that seems like a sort of unusual perspective for a lot of musicians to have based both on your book and also my own personal experiences talking to people and knowing people in, in the business and whatnot. I mean, and, 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 and one of the things that I really enjoyed reading your book was the way you drew on some other sociological work, including, among other things, one of my favorite books, Howard Becker's Outsiders. And, and, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the ideology of signing, at least from your perspective, affects the way that musicians think about what they do as artists as opposed to as business people. Yeah, I mean, it drives them. It, it really structures their whole way of thinking about what it means to make music. So for me, the, the ideology of getting signed is really close to the ideology of copyright. Um, so they get into the game and they think this is the path that I want to lead. One of the things that I talk about extensively is the TV show, The Voice. Um, and The Voice is quintessential in this. People watch other people perform on The Voice and they think that that's the way that they're going to make it. So then they follow those footsteps. They go to the big uh, auditions that they have at stadiums. They think that if they can just get on TV and be observed, then they'll get all this extra um, publicity, which will turn into fame and fortune. And because they see it, they know it, they want to live it. And a lot of it's uh, fake. So if we think in terms of Taylor Swift, yes, Taylor Swift is big, she's famous. But if you watch a show, uh, and I'll date myself, like MTV Cribs, I don't know that you can really watch MTV Cribs anymore. But when you watch MTV Cribs, they sell this idea of um, stardom that leads to a big house with fancy cars and a crazy media center inside your home. But then what ends up happening is a lot of times those houses are rented just for the shooting. So when people watch on TV, these paths of these uh, famous musicians, they ascribe that to who they want to be. And they want to be the person that's signed to a record contract and has all this conspicuous consumptive goods. I don't, did that get to what you were asking? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think so. And like, I, I I guess really what I found most sort of fascinating and kind of troubling about the story that you tell is that you know, as an abstract matter, we have a story around copyright that we like to tell and we like to believe that by creating property rights we sort of indirectly encourage creativity and innovation. But the story you tell in a lot of ways is sort of the opposite, right? That ownership and business actually kind of in, seems at least to encourage people to curb their creativity and to be less innovative and to produce something they think they can sell. Right. And it's, it's explicitly through the recording contract that uh, musicians give up their autonomy. So if I want to play music right now, I could do whatever I wanted to. Nobody can tell me what it's going to sound like. But the second they sign a record contract, you've got the A&R staff um, saying it needs to sound like this. Um, one, one of the best songs 
that addresses this is Sarah Bareilles's "I'm Not Going to Write You a Love Song." Are you familiar with that song? Uh, yeah, I've I've heard it many years ago. I was thinking of uh, Van Morrison, "Big Fat Royalty Check" as well. Oh, I haven't heard that one. I'll need to check that one out. But the, Bareilles, what she essentially says is, "You wanted me. You asked for it. I had it, it, like as you read into the song." Uh, I had multiple offers coming in on record contracts. I went with you, and now you tell me that I need you, and you need me to write a love song, and I don't want to write a love song. Um, and and that's the general thing that ends up happening once you sign a record contract. If you don't write your own music, they pick out the music that you're going to perform. So there's also an interesting dynamic for people who are signed to these contracts that they are just a musician, um, like a studio musician. When you're not writing your own music and your A&R person comes and says, I want you to record this song and I want you to do it this way. And then you go in and you record it. You didn't write it. You're singing just the same way that the drummer's drumming or the bass player's playing bass it's no different except your contractual relationship says that you don't the label doesn't owe you anything for doing this recording whereas if you got a session musician they're at least getting paid and if they're good at negotiating they might even have a chunk of royalties that that comes to them there too that's not even recoupable right so there's these different relationships that exist within the 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 whole scenario Um, but the question still remains around autonomy. How autonomous is the recording artist? And the answer is they're not autonomous at all. Mm -hmm. Well, so David, I understand your book is going to be coming out pretty soon, um, like in August or so, but they're already working on a new project around streaming. So in closing, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your new project and where you expect it to go. Sure. Uh, The book that I'm working on, it's called Streaming Culture. It's going to be published by Emerald Publishing sometime next year. It looks at the way streaming is both cultural uh, in the context of um, the content that we stream is cultural content, whether it's movies, music, uh, television, video games, etc., or the culture that we form around the consumption of these goods. So each chapter looks at a different instance of streaming. Um, so there's music, movies, television, video, and then I, I have like new formations like Twitch or something. Um, and the real focus on this is developing a concept that I call unending consumption and unending consumption. When you think in terms of music is the very fact that people used to purchase a finite amount of music. So you'd go, you'd buy a CD. It might cost you $15, but you own that CD. You can listen to it forever uh, until you break it or it gets too scratched up. And there's nothing anybody can do to charge you more for it with unending consumption. In the case of music, now people pay $10 a month to have pretty infinite, uh, choices of music. So they can access millions of songs for $10 a month, but if they stop subscribing, you don't have access to anything. So over the course of a year, you might spend $120 to access a subscription to Spotify. But once you stop, you don't have $120 worth of music at hand for the rest of your life. You really have nothing. So I try to explore these different dynamics in this book. Well, I look forward to seeing it. Um, I really enjoyed reading your your book on the music industry and talking to you about it. And it was quite an enlightening perspective for me on, you know, kind of how the music industry works from the perspective of an insider and from a musician as opposed to from the outside. Well, thank you very much for having me, Brian. And I certainly enjoyed this conversation.
I'm waiting for my royalty check to come, and it still hasn't come yet. It's about a year overdue. I guess it's coming from the big royalty check in the sky. I waited, and the mailman never dropped it in my letterbox oh, I guess it's a big world to check in the sky ooh baby But you can Beat the tax man And me All at once 